Welcome to the Legends of Iron. I'm John Anderson. Meet my co-host, Nick Best, and Aki Williams. We're going to have some amazing guests on the show. Buckle up tight, because we're going to be talking about the shit you're not supposed to be talking about. We're going to be discussing anything and everything it takes to become a legend of iron. Legends of Iron is brought to you by Muscle Mints. Muscle Mints is the creator of Carnivore Pure Beef Protein Isolates. Beef builds muscle and Carnivore is the world's number one selling beef protein. Welcome to another edition of Legends of Iron. I am John Anderson. With me always my partners in crime, Nick Best and Akim Williams. Unfortunately, Akim is on the way to India to do some guest appearances. He won't be here today, but it doesn't matter because we have got a guest for you, let me tell you. We have got an exciting guest for you today. This guy is one of my favorite ever bodybuilders for a number of reasons. Number one, he just fucking crushed shit for over a decade. If there was a big contest and he was there, he was in the mix. If he wasn't winning, the motherfucker. The second thing is this guy was fucking strong. And we're talking not just strong. We are talking fucking cock strong. He's moving weights around most people would dream about. And then finally, my favorite reason is because this dude was the bad boy of bodybuilding, the rock star of bodybuilding, partying all night, showing up to a contest and still winning the motherfucker. (laughs) <laughs> Chris Cormier, Chris Cormier, the real deal. Welcome to the show. What's going down, my brother? What's up, baby? How you doing, brother? Oh man, Good to I'm see really exci- I'm so excited to have you on the show, brother. You've been one of my favorites from the jump, man. I got to tell you, you know the, you, the way the way that you were able to do what you did was amazing. But then when you look a look a little deeper and you see you know, what you were doing while you were actually at the top. Fucking amazing, bro. I know, I know in your, in your, your movie, you talked about, there was a couple of year period where you were really in partying deep, but you were still winning three shows a year, which is absolutely crazy. So, you know, everybody knows you're, you're, you're a legend, you're a hall of famer, you're, you're one of the top of the top, but what I don't think people quite understand is that you were burning the candle on both sides. So let's start off talking. There was a few years where you were partying like every day, most of the week. And yeah, still it was, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It uh, was. Uh, thanks for having me on the show, by the way. Uh, appreciate Absolutely, it. Absolutely, uh, brother. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's I mean, the only, the only thing with that is like it was it wasn't my entire career or anything like that, but it was. It was a strong two years from uh, 99, 2000, 2001 that, you know, things were a little hairy, you know, to say the least. And uh, it was... <laughs> you, were uh, winning, you were winning the Ironmans at this point, too. You were winning oh yeah, you won oh the yeah. Ironman four, four years in a row. And oh, yeah. You were Most definitely. <laughs> Most definitely. And, yeah. and I was just mad at the end that I didn't do it more while I was here because, you know, on that stage... You know, I was, it really brought out the most of my physique. And even though I didn't win the Olympia, it was a lot of Olympians, winner, Olympian winners that I beat in that Ironman show. Yeah. You know, from Ronnie to to Jay, uh, Dexter, uh, they all did, they all placed behind me in that Ironman show before. So that's one thing yeah. I wish I would have did more of. I actually saw John Balick this past weekend at the uh, expo here in san diego so i took a photo with him and uh that was that that was uh you know we were just talking about the old times because he would never make me sign a contract to show up at a show i just called him on the phone and say say john i'm coming to the show he said all right i'll see you there and then (laughs) i'll jump up there and go down there and kick some ass and come back (laughs) (laughs) so I, I saw, I believe it was Iron Man. You you won, obviously, and you're giving a little speech afterwards, and you're telling everybody, "Hey, I know everybody knows that I party and have fun, but I also work hard." Then you went into talking about you were going to go basically start off the Cheesecake Factory. I think you said you were going to yeah, 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 yeah. You were going you were going to run the city. You were going to hit all yeah. the clubs <laughs> in the city. So 
So, yeah. so real quick, kind of help us understand because there's people that they, they they go have fun, and then there's people that have a little more fun, and then there's the Chris Cormiers that are just blowing the fucking <laughs> the top off of the night. So help us understand here. I mean, because obviously you talked about obvious, you know, partying. There's a lot of levels of partying. You, you talked about alcohol. You talked about drugs. You even talked about having a new vein issue. So tell me, you went, you win a contest. Describe the next twelve, maybe twenty four hours. <laughs> that depends if I win or lost. <laughs> if I, you know, give us a loss. Let's say, yeah, let's let's say for instance, yeah, for instance, like uh, right after the show. Even before the show, I had a, I mean, I had, it'd be like 20 to 30 people in my room. And this is, you know, getting ready for the show. You know, it's guys and girls there. Some people are, some people are partying, some people are posing, some people are showing their physique or whatever. Uh, We're getting, we're getting dressed to go out for the night. But I'd, I'd be in an entourage of 20 people on average until things settle down. But it was at least 20 people around me uh, on the average when I would go. But let's say at the Mandalay Bay, um, right after the show, I was very happy, 1999. Uh, but, but getting ready for the show, and uh, I was flying to Vegas every weekend up until five weeks out just to go out there and dance and, and you know, just start getting on the stage and <laughs> controlling the crowd, you know, doing a little dancing, a little posing, you know, pants to my ankles, shirt off, that type of thing. And that <laughs> that, was, that was like a norm for me, you know. So a lot of times when people saw me out, I was probably in my underwear at most of these clubs around the world, not just in America. <laughs> it was just my thing, you know. <laughs> Look at that. And you're partying for like a couple of days here sometimes, yeah. I mean, it's not a yeah, just, yeah. you're not you're, mean, not you're not going out for the night. I mean, you're 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 loading up and you're fucking going for it. I Describe, mean, that was I mean, my release. That was my release, man. Because you know, I had a lot of pressure on me. I, I mean, people don't understand the pressure you put on yourself personally, but then you have fans that's putting pressure. They want to see you do well. You got uh, sponsorships, sponsors that want to see you do well, and that pushed you to compete. Sometimes I didn't want to compete. But I had to compete. I was invited to the Arnold Classic. I was invited. You know, I, I was qualified for the Olympia. So every six months, I'm doing five or six shows. I'm doing ten shows a year. So people who think I was, I, uh, it's I didn't win the Olympia because I had party. No, and that's not the reason. You know, if you want to, if you want to put the fact that I was actually really burning my candle at both ends, yeah, to where I couldn't really, I couldn't really. Uh, have a lot of downtime so i need i want to release in my mind to be free of no thoughts of no care in the world just having a good time and that's the way i was doing it you know and i was uh, i'd go from let's say after arnold classic that they, they i stopped going to the banquet after party banquet thing they have for the arnold i just go straight to the club sometime i have my clothing <laughs> trunks on because I know I'm taking these pants off and I know I'm taking this shirt off. So I just go, <laughs> I just, oh I just get the color off and get my ass to the club. And then as soon as I get to the club, no drink, no not, nothing. Just as soon as I hit the door, I'm up on the stage and I got my clothes off and I'm just doing my thing. I mean, a lot of times I see like Ronnie in the audience. I see like Ronnie at the club and Ronnie just, he was sitting there like, damn boy. You are killing me, you're <laughs> cracking me up right now. But I had a couple of after parties that I that Ronnie and the, all the all the crew, you know, different bodybuilders went there and stuff. And you know, back then, yeah, people were pretty free. A lot of the chicks that I was with in my group, they're they're in there topless at the show at the at the party, whether it's a club or a house party. Uh, uh, you see. Uh, like I say, I was just, I was just free, free, just free living, and uh, I mean, you're, you're you know, winning at show it, to show and, it, it, and you're winning. It. It's hard to argue with your hard, formula. You know what I mean? Hard, yeah, exactly. in that moment, what how are you, you going to say? How do you turn it off? <laughs> <laughs> you 
Yeah. How do you turn that off? <laughs> when you're having a good time. You're collecting checks. You're going from, you know, you're like, one day I'm here. Oh, I want to fly to Amsterdam tomorrow. You know, something like that. And I go hang on Amsterdam for a few months or Australia for a few months. I uh, went to, uh, I was in uh, even Ireland for a few months. Uh, uh, for a couple of years, I've done that too. But I've been, you know, at the time I was just going with whatever. And that was, as soon as I'm done with a competition, I'm, I'm just want to be out of my mind for, for a little bit, just to, just to break out the monotony of, of the constant training. There have been a lot of times, a lot of holidays where I was in, uh, in contest form, con contest form fully to where I have no holiday. You know, I just buy whatever's mm -hmm. necessary to treat or with the presents. Daddy's in the gym, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. I, when I became a father, everything was, it was like right in the middle. I remember, I remember uh, getting ready for the 98 Olympia. And I was just about to walk out the door to go and compete. And I was in Madison Square Garden. Uh, and I, just about to walk out the door. That's that's like when the phone would ring in the hotel room. You would pick it up, like back in those days. So I picked up the hotel <laughs> cell phone, <laughs> I, you know, the phone, and I, I pick it up and say, "Hey, they say um, I'm pregnant, and um, you're gonna be a father." You know, nine months from now, nine months from that that phone call, he came exactly the day that the doctor said. <clears throat> And uh wow. wow. So yeah, so I was like, hold on, I gotta I gotta <laughs> you know, I'll talk to you later. So that's <laughs> so I went down to compete at the I took sixth in at Olympia. Uh left straight from there, went when we went straight to the clubs and I'm like really in limelight with uh mm -hmm. uh oh, exit. We were going to bounce around to different clubs in New York. Uh, Sound Factor is my favorite in New York. That was my absolute favorite, and uh, yeah. Um, so I so I left there, and I'm in. I remember I was in one of the clubs, and I was like, "Man, I gotta, I gotta get going, guys. I gotta go." It was like nine o'clock in the morning, and uh, everyone was like, "No, like stay, man. Like we 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 still got some more partying to do." I said, "I got a photo shoot to do." So I. So I was like literally oh, late for my photo shoot. I'm in the club. <laughs> so, I, so I took a cab to the hotel and grabbed some things. And they were already waiting outside the hotel. Uh, that was with Brian Moss. And he was like one of the top uh, creative uh, photographers back, uh, you know, when I was competing. So he, uh, they were waiting out there with an RV. So I jumped in the RV, still filming the night before. And went straight to a photo shoot in which I was, uh, you know, falling asleep in between takes. Sometimes falling asleep listening to him <laughs> to see what we we're gonna do next. We had changing all the different costumes and stuff, so I was just like falling asleep <laughs> the whole day. So I'll just have my eyes closed and then I'd open them, and then everyone's looking at me. <laughs> I got totally asleep, like right in the middle of the whole photo shoot. It was some great oh. shots though, but I, I pulled it off. But man. <laughs> you know, it, it was just uh, like that, you know. That's crazy, brother. I know during this wow. time, especially in your documentary, you talked about, you know, obviously there was a lot of a lot of partying the drugs. And you talked about New Bain and some different stuff that was going on during that time. How do you feel this stuff? What? How do you feel that it helped you or hurt you, so to speak, when you were competing? Obviously, you know. I mean, it just, it just, um. I would just say, you know, when you're a bodybuilder, when you're a competitive person, you're taking things for everything. You're taking things to get bigger, taking things to get leaner, taking things taking to get stronger. Pain. You're taking yeah. things for pain. So it was nothing yeah. different to me from what I was. Yeah. This is what I got to do, and I got to do it. Whatever I got to do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what I got to do because this is my goal, and this yeah. is this is what I signed up for is to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And it you just know, so, so happens that some of those some of those substances made for a great party. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So well, that's yeah. Nice. So that's 
yeah, so then I was just like, uh, you know, between that and, you know, coming off the drugs of a competition itself can leave you a little, uh, sorry about that, my kids. <laughs> uh, so it would leave you, some of those things would leave you, uh, oh my God. No worries, brother. Don't sweat it. We all right. got lives to deal. We all got yeah, lives to man. deal with, you know. <laughs> that's baby mama calling too. That's the one. That's the one who called me on the phone when I was going to go to compete. She made, she made a cameo appearance just in time. He's man. still doing it. Shit. Both of them. He's still doing it again. <laughs> uh, that's yeah, that's I love it. That's good. Hey, stuff, keep it a keeper. <laughs> oh, that's good shit, man. So you were oh, saying that sometimes you're drugs coming, yeah, off, some, coming some, off a competition. Some, yeah, you're getting depressed. You want to feel better, but it, but you know a lot of a lot of bodybuilders went through things. They don't really talk about it. I know, but a lot. I'm sure I yeah, share the same sentiment. A lot of a lot of a lot of competitor c- competitive uh, sport uh, categories. They they probably experienced that stuff, you know? So it was, it was like, I think for the most point, uh, I would get up to 290 some pounds in between shows. And I think at that time I'm more relaxed because I only have like a month of relaxation to before I get ready, before it's time to start getting ready to gear it up for another show. And a lot of these shows, like I said, I didn't want to do, but I had to mm-hmm. because I had a, uh, I had a, I was in, well, I was with Weeder at the time, and I was just starting to leave Weeder, and I was just starting to go with uh, Muscle Tech. Uh, they were courting me and, you know, taking me out to lunch and <laughs> doing whatever special little thing they could do to, get my attention to be like, hey, man, we we want to sign you and be real serious about it. So I started adding stuff on the on the cart for uh, <laughs> if you really want me, how about if you really yeah. want me go in yeah. these first class seats, if you really want me, give me four <laughs> years to set it at one, you know, that type yeah. of thing. So a lot of that, uh, but I, as far as putting on more mass in, the, in that small, I never really had an off season. So I think yeah. that was the biggest thing that kept me from progressing even more so. And also the style of training I was doing. I was I was going, I'm doing like 525 on the incline for for about uh uh two reps. I do like I was doing like five hundred for four, but on a day on like every time I went to the gym for a chest or something like that, I was I was I wasn't maxing out, but I was definitely going pretty heavy, you know, two hundred pound dumbbells and Stuff like oh, that, you, dude. So, you were moving around yeah, big weights. There's things to watch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, yeah. I mean, yeah, they're strong. I love they're that. Strong, and then they're strong. I mean, yeah. you, you got you got professional strength athletes that would make those claims, and you were body. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I was, I was. So like when we did a lift, mm-hmm. myself and um, uh, Rico McClendon and Flex Wheeler, we would half the gym, half the half half the. The room, most of the room, and half of the, the other room would be watching that lift because back back in those days, you know, people did those type of lifts in the Gold's Gym. People wanted to see it; they wanted to witness it, mm-hmm. you know. And that was that was basically every time we went into the gym, it was something like that. Yeah, so. yeah. <clears throat> well, brother, I'll tell you, man, you you your story is amazing because most people, obviously, myself as a bodybuilder. I play by all the rules, man. I'm going to sleep on time. I'm <laughs> by eight o'clock. I do all the things, all the things necessary, and, and they couldn't even come I was close never, to it. You, you know what I mean? And I that, still can't sleep then, though. I, I, most, but, <laughs> but I used to bounce. I was a bouncer at Roxbury, so that's when the whole thing with the Tyson and the whole everything happened with him and the whole. Mm-hmm. So he came through there with his his little Tell bullshit. us that story, bro. Tell us that story. That's a good yeah, one, man. The Mike Tyson story. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you got to tell us the Mike Tyson story. 
<laughs> oh man, I was this is like 1992. I was I was training for the Mr. USA for those those periods of time. I was around 23, 20, 24 years old. And I, you know, I came out of uh I got introduced to him that day because his whole crew came in there and uh it was about maybe about 20 guys with him and his neck was like this. And it was like, I remember he was sitting there and he was like, it was like a line of girls. And back then everyone had a little black book back in the nineties. The but this guy had a yellow pad, those yellow pad like this. He was like a little black book. <laughs> true story, dude, true story. And it was a whole line of girls out the VIP room waiting in line to give him his phone number. Uh, you know, and contact information. So I know for a fact this guy never raped anybody. That's for damn sure, for one. <laughs> <laughs> they were throwing it at him. He didn't have to, you know? So yeah. So then um, I went to, it was, the, the club was over. Um, I was there um, standing by his limo. He had a limo, a, limo, a limousine. Uh, two Harley Davidsons and uh, and a Rolls Royce, all caravan. All his people was in it, and obviously he was he wasn't in the the the, the vehicle yet. But I was standing by it, and then this girl was telling me, "Hey, you uh, you slept." He said, "Hey." You know, I can't believe you worked for this guy. He's a fucking asshole. And I would just, I would just tell her, I don't work for Mike Tyson. I work for the club. I work at Roxbury. And then as soon as I said that, slapped me from the back of the head. Boom. And his hands, I'm telling you right now, is hard as nails. Like, like his hands are no joke. <laughs> you know, so, and my brother... <laughs> And, you know, I was close enough to my, my one brother. That was, like, one of my pet peeves in life is to get slapped in the back of the head because my brother did that to me all the time when we yeah. grew up. So when that happened, I just got full of rage and was probably probably some trend balloon at the time, parabon at the time, <laughs> in there, mixed in there, too. And I turned around and was like, motherfucker, like that. And it was Mike Tyson. So you if you can understand what that must feel like to turn around. <laughs> oh my god! I was like, oh, wait yeah. A <laughs> so, oh yeah! Oh <laughs> yeah! 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 You you can't think breaks. of a worse person. You cannot think of a worse hey, person. But I'm on that small. To. I'm on that small list of people that probably said that too. <laughs> <laughs> Survived. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I then, love it. and I'll tell you exactly what happened. He said this. He goes, he goes. He told me to do it, talking about a guy next to him. But he had this high pitched voice. You understand? I we, we yeah, yeah, yeah. He told me to do it, and then uh, and I looked. I said, "This motherfucker!" And it was like I was just raging. Dude. I was just, I just wanted something, <laughs> right? And so it was a little Italian guy next to him, and he looked at him. He was like, he looked at Mike like like me, like I, like that, right? And then. He goes, well, what you want to do? And then he started coming at me like this, right? Oh, oh yeah, well, what you want to do? Like oh, this, I'm going, holy fuck. So I'm like, oh, yeah. so I'm like, in my mind, I'm saying this shit, right? I'm like, fuck, 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 fuck. So then I'm like, pass it up. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm like, okay, we about to do this. This, about, this is happening right now, right? <laughs> and Rico was like over in the over yonder a little bit. Lex was like over here, but it was a bunch of his guys here. And this is Mike and it was me. And I'm backing up and I'm backing up and I'm like, okay. So he, so people started coming in between us. And I was just like, and people were like, oh, you want to press charges? You want to press charges? Uh, everybody's seen them do it. And like that. And I was just like, I said, I don't want to press no fucking charges. I just, I just want to get a lick back. I just want to, Something back, you know. I just want to get off right now. I, I just want to get something out. I don't care about. I don't. 
I probably would have got a few hundred thousand dollars on that one because I'm telling you, dog, he, he hit me with a, a lot of it was a lot of shit behind that slap, dude. I was like, <laughs> dude. But the thing is, at the time, I was so pissed, and I was still mad even throughout the week. I remember telling my mother about it. I was like, Ma, I was like, I want to. I don't, I don't. I said, this is not over. Like we, I, I need to. This is we gotta. We got. <laughs> Have a discussion. We got something's got to happen. Something, and I remember her just saying, "Just be careful, and you know, just you know, don't lose your mind. Just th you know, think things through." And so I got my buddy uh, Rico and a few guys that I work with at the club, and we decided the next weekend we was gonna go look for Mike. So we went to go. <laughs> Let's go look for Mike Tyson. That's what we need to do. There's so few people on the planet who would go look for Mike Tyson. Oh my god. Uh, this is gonna go look for Mike. This is this settle this shit. Right? So we we go down to uh Larry Parker's down in uh down in uh, this is in Beverly Hills because everyone used to go there after the club. So it was like it was about four, four or five of us. I don't remember exactly, but we get we go into Larry Parker's. He's not there. We're getting some food, so they start. Uh, so he he comes in, and they started playing like his fights and greatest hits or whatever. Mike Tyson was on the thing, so we see him. And then so like okay, we're gonna start antagonizing this guy, right? So they showed the one where he got hit and his mouthpiece comes out and he's trying to come on the ground to pick up the mouthpiece. Yeah. They're trying to put they showing that on the screen. So we just laughing at the top of our lungs, like <laughs> 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 laughing at the screen, like we laughing at him for getting knocked down, right? And we turn and then we turn around and look at him. Like, yeah, we laughing at you, right? And then he goes, he goes, shit happens. Like that. And he said, like, <laughs> shit happens. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so he started to walk to go go to the bathroom. And uh, it was some people we knew that was in his crew that, that was, there was this one girl that we knew that he was, her job was just to buy condoms. That was her job keep his condom shit stacked. That's, she got paid for that shit. And, Re and my, my buddy Rico knew her. And then <laughs> oh my God. it was, uh, it was uh, just different little characters he would have with him, but I'm sure they're all getting paid some kind of way. But he he, called the he walked by our table and my buddy goes, uh, uh, Rico goes, hey man, why you slapped my homeboy like that in the head last week at the, at the, at the club? And he's like, oh, he's a big guy. He could take it. Like that, right? <laughs> and so I kind of took that as an apology and shit. <laughs> I was like, I was like, well, I, he apologized. I was, I was a little bigger than he was at the time. But you know what? The funny thing, I've been introduced to him like a few times, and he never seemed to remember who I was. Like, every time I meet him, like motherfucker, you know me. Like you can't, <laughs> like you can't say you see this face that many times and you don't recognize that same person. Well, How many check times? this out, brother. Check this out. So your name, the real deal, because you look like Evander Holyfield. So I know, imagine, imagine, <laughs> so imagine, imagine, Mike, Mike slaps you and slaps this big black guy. I know. Like, this you turn around and it's like, fuck, Evander gained a hundred pounds. What the fuck am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was that probably part. that brief second where he's thinking, oh, my God, I'm in fucking trouble here, man. Oh, man. <laughs> so I, took, so I, I took that as an apology, but years, you know, years later, I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? Like, what are you? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> what the hell was I, I thinking, though, right? Brother, brother, there but is like so I say, I'm on, people. I'm on a short list of people that I, I'm yes. sure that I can tell that, that type of story. Yeah, brother. I was gonna yeah. say there's so few, so few people on the planet that would try to go find Mike Tyson. Oh, man! Let's go get him, man. That's fucking, that's fucking crazy shit right there, brother. That is crazy shit. Oh my! Good story, God. man. Yeah. So this was 
this was all in that <clears throat> in that time period where you know you're you're just kind of you're kind of like the rock star of the uh, uh, bodybuilding. You're winning contests. And everything is just crushing for you. I know when you were really partying, there was a period where you actually overdosed. I believe you said you overdosed on cocaine. Uh, yeah, that and, was, and you felt like you was, almost uh, died. <clears throat> yeah, that was in the year two thousand something. But it was it was crazy, man. It was because, like you say, there's there's depression, there's all kinds of things mixing up with, um, you know, your newbie father, you. All these different things, and um, I—I I mean, somehow I got myself to go with this chick I was dating. She was she. We had went to some AA meetings and some stuff like that, and then it just like I just like once I admitted I had a situation, I had a problem, then I was like, oh, I got to deal with this shit, you know? Because my mom was even like, my mom and dad was like trying to be supportive but it was like every time they had asked me hey you got a situation i was like no i don't have a situation <laughs> like that's one of the worst things i wanted <clears> to tell <throat> my mother you know but she could she could see right through that stuff and <clears throat> actually before she passed she actually told me all the different stuff that she she knew but she didn't she was just trying to <clears throat> let me walk through it and, and and get through the best way she knew how but she just didn't want to like but she knew a lot of stuff that I was doing or did. And, you know, sometimes it'd be a party at my house and, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a bunch of people all around partying for days at my house at a time, but my parents had a key. So she walked in on like twice, <coughs> oh, on, like everything oh going God. on, you know? So <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I don't even know why. <laughs> But, you know, they live really close. I had moved them up there so they could help me with my cooking and my cleaning and my, you know, my everyday uh, things that they can do as parents. And they they wanted, they were very supportive. And uh, it was, yeah, it was just, uh, it was a crazy time. But, you know, I got past that point and then everything died down and then it was less people around each year. It'd be smaller and smaller group. And then I finished on my career when it was like totally under, under control. But <laughs> at, it was for a time. It was it was a good 20 people from around the world would be in my group of people that I hung out with. And that's the thing. It's like people who are special people, you got to keep, you got to make sure you're keeping special people around you. Because a lot of times, and some of those, some of those group of people, there were good people and there were, good people in their own right to where we're still friends to this day that I met just like on a whim going to a party and say, yo, come, come on, let's uh, hang out. And we still like really close friends to this day. You know, you know, buddy of mine, uh, Shane O'Hearn, like I met just like that. And we still like such, so really close to this day. Uh, and he lived in Texas, but you know, we'd be going through New Orleans, going through, Texas doing a whole doing the whole deal there, you know. And you know how New Orleans is like they they're looking for a reason to party in New Orleans. Oh and yeah. I'd see my, <laughs> I'd see my <laughs> and I'd see my, you know, I, I you know, I went out there and I, I partied a few times or guest posed a few times out there. Oh. Uh but yeah, it was just it was I mean, you know, at the time it's like you think you're invincible anyway. So, you know, this night nothing's gonna hurt what I'm trying to do but the only thing I wish I would have done is like kept some of the people that did, clearly didn't have any type of goal in life to be an extra special person and yeah. allowed them to be close enough to affect me in some type of way you know that's the one thing yeah. I do regret out of the whole thing you know but uh, when I got to the show you know it was only a couple of times that <laughs> that it was pretty pretty stupid to even partake in this stuff uh like i did right before the show sometimes i'm in a i remember one time i was in a strip club just because i didn't have no i ate all my food I, and i had nothing else to do it was still like so early i'm like i'll just go to a strip club and then all these fans <laughs> were in there what are you doing here you should be resting i'm like dude i am i'm chilling i'm resting i'm fine i was just, just i'm chilling in the strip club. I'm here in Chicago. 
competing in the Olympia, and I just wanted to check out the local talent. You know, <laughs> so he <it> was. <laughs> wow, I love I'm like that. You now here's the question: yeah. Could you imagine going through this period with cell phones the way we have them now? No, oh, <laughs> and man. or social media. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Say, it's def- I definitely probably wouldn't have made it through that period. But but you know what, though? The funny thing is we had our ways to communicate and do things without all that stuff. Um, it's just that that whatever. And, and think about it. We used to remember all the cell phone numbers. I mean, all the phone numbers yeah. in our head. Yeah. Now we can't remember yeah. our own family members' phone numbers. Yeah. Just because it's so truth. easy just to do that, you know. So, uh, and what about the emergency breakthrough? We don't have, we had the emergency breakthrough back in the day. We yeah. Had somebody yeah. Breaking, oh through my. Yourself, breaking through Jesus. your lives. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't oh work. God. Oh my God. No. Yeah, Remember the emergency breakthrough? <laughs> Very well. <laughs> Oh, I'm a little too well. <laughs> so That's yeah, good oh shit. My God. That's and I good know this shit. guy, and then you know, and I had a I had a wrestling career. Uh, I went to Cal State Bakersfield. Um, I love wrestling still to this day. I love wrestling so much to watch it, and uh, even if you could do you know move around a little bit, but I also played football. This guy yep. can tell you that. <laughs> yes, you did. You were not yeah. a lot of fun to tackle. <laughs> <laughs> He's a hell of a running back. Yeah, man. <laughs> Strong safety, pull back. You know, you were, you, were, you, 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 and you were bodybuilding through all this too. And you because you yeah. went to college for football and I believe wrestling also. And but wrestling, you were bodybuilding yeah. the whole time. Yeah, so, so you were developing your mm-hmm. craft as a bodybuilder pretty much from the oh, time yeah, you were the whole a teen. Time. Yeah, because my mm-hmm. high school teacher, when I was like 15, thought it'd be a good idea if I tried bodybuilding. She thought I had a good body and a good frame that I could probably put some good muscle on and be this bodybuilder guy. And I was like, really? You think so? But I was actually shy also. So it was like, I didn't know how I was going to get on stage and take off all my clothes at the time. But then <laughs> it was just like, I went to the show just like 1983. I went to the show just to watch it and at Palm Springs High. And uh, Mike Christian was a guest poser. And uh, that was the first bodybuilder that I saw that I was like, oh, man, I, like, I want to be like this, you know. Uh, then uh, Bob Birdsong actually lived in Palm Springs. Uh, Rachel McLeish uh, <clears throat> lived in Palm Springs also. That's where I met uh, saw Matt Mendenhall. He was in Palm Springs all at the same time. But I didn't... I didn't uh, get close to these people, but I, I had short little conversation with these people but I, that's when I was like <clears throat> I went to uh, College of the Desert and played two years there mm-hmm. and I, was, I made the All-State All-State uh, JC team for uh, Strong Safety and uh, uh, and then I was just like I want to be this bodybuilder I want to I, I stood up right out of class and left and never went back and, no uh, shit well, yeah I was, I was in business <laughs> I was in business law <laughs> class, and I remember, I knew I was in business law class, and I was writing down Mr. U.S., Mr. Teenager California, Mr. Teenage National Champion, Mr. USA, Mr. Olympia, and I remember I was looking at the list of Mr. Olympias and competitions I wanted to win, and I just looked at the door, and I got up, and I just left and never went back and moved to Venice, and then that's what I was going to be doing. And that was it. Bam. That was it. Jesus. I'm out. Up, I'm going to go do this like that. And and I just the, set my mind to it. And then the the, the, the chapter of Chris Cormier, the bodybuilder, starts and just got yeah. bigger and better the whole time, man. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's funny because you say that, you know, what was stopping you from bodybuilding originally was taking your clothes off. Well, fast forward 10 years, you're on the stage. And then you don't even take your trunks off. You just rinse off and go to the club. And take, <laughs> as, as you put, put your, you know, the pants around your ankles, you, know, you, got, you, you, you got past that fear real, real good, brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go figure that, huh? Oh, man, that's crazy. 
So I, I, I got a question. So throw myself in the fire enough that I, it won't bother me to, to to not show how shy I really am, you know? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. how it happened. So let me add, let's let's go back. Quick question. So you said there was a couple times where you were, you know, your mom keyed into your house, and obviously there's parties going on. So what does she <laughs> open the door to see? Naked people running around and people drinking and doing blow yeah. and all sorts of shit. It was just like, did she actually make it in the house or did she just kind yeah. of close the door? Well, someone knocked on the door, knocked on my door, and I'm like laying in bed. They're like, hey, your mom is there. And I'm like, what? I'm like, so I go outside <laughs> and my mother's like, she's leaning on the rail like this. And I go outside and I'm like, and she's like, because. Uh, what what kind of life are you living? I remember she said that. What kind of life are you living? Like, is this what you, like, you know, she was just like, what are you doing, man? Like, I said, Ma, I said, you can't just come in. It's like, I, you know, it's just my private, private house and I'm, you know, whatever. But she was just like, man, she was just like, the hell? How many people were in there? And my dad, I remember my dad was like, how many people would be there? Yeah, how many people did she walk into? Was it like 25, like 30 14, people? Yeah, probably like 14, 15, 20. So, rock in Something the house, like baby. Rock in the All house. All over the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I remember uh, it was some days. I remember uh, when I left that situation and I went to go guest pose, but I just spent – three, four days awake. And then I went to sleep. And when I woke up, just enough time to catch my plane to make it to uh, Colorado one time. And I remember <clears throat> making it to my hotel room. But you know, when you get startled out of your sleep, and you just wake up. I remember waking up and I didn't know where I was, why I was. <laughs> Where was I supposed to go? At what time? Who was picking me up? I didn't know anything. So I was just like, holy shit. So I, so I started to call, call around to find out all this information. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? And all this type of stuff. But it, it, so it's like, like I say, this was a strong two-year period. This is, wasn't throughout my whole career. Yeah. It was a it kind of wasn't period. At the end, but, but that two-year period, it was it was pretty, it was nuts, man. Right? Like, and then the, the different times I'd compete before the show and after the show, there's at least 20, 20, 30 people in my room, at least. Because you had, you had mentioned chaotic. that <clears throat> you had mentioned that during that during that two to three or two year period or that period of time that sometimes you would be you would be high four days out of the week. But yet you're still Definitely. winning shows. You're still Definitely. winning shows during this period. I was a so, beast. I was a beast still. I was still mm -hmm. like but I knew, but I felt like I knew when to stop, and I knew when to, when to to chill, and to this one I need to focus, and I was able to switch it. And I was like, boom! I got to get to work. I got to, yeah. I got to do this. You know, I had a, uh, you know, I got the Arnold Classic coming up, and here I am, ten weeks out. I got to, or whatever, twelve weeks out, 15, fourteen weeks out. Uh, I spent that whole month, or whatever, you know, relaxing, shopping. You know, every month I'm going. I'm tightening up the wardrobe and tightening up the, <laughs> you know, say so I got to be ready. <laughs> so I'm buying like, I'm buying like six outfits every month. Head to toe outfit every month, six of them. Get the and Louis Vuitton was, going, uh, all that good stuff. Yeah, I got the, got the whole, got the Louis Vuitton going with the whole Rolex thing going and the whole, just living it, you know. But, it wasn't the smart way. It was, I mean, I should have been investing in stuff. And it, but then when I tried to invest in stuff, I got railroaded by people. You know, I had a this lady trying to take care of the money. So, you know, she's trying to be the accountant. I'm trying to get. Uh, I was about to try to get into this restaurant deal. That guy turned out to be a gambling degenerate. That I was. Oh no! I was just about. To, yeah, I was about to. Yeah. So. That was that was in Vegas when I was living in Vegas for a short time, and man, living in Vegas, boy, was <laughs> that was hard on me <laughs> at that time because I was like, shit, that's like <laughs> I was waking up at two thirty every day. <laughs> 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 
go to sleep at five, waking up at two thirty, two thirty three. My whole clock was just ass backwards in Vegas. Oh, yeah, you got to be very ass. disciplined if you live here to not get. In yeah, you got to. <laughs> you, you, you can walk out the door any time yeah, of day, you, twenty four hours a day. You can be in your and house. Trouble to get into southern Southern Highlands, Southern Highlands. Oh, right okay, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was living in Southern Highlands, but you can go get into whatever you want to get into. It's still like twenty minutes, thirty minutes to be yeah, into anything, you know. But yeah, right down uh, the freeway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Nice. That's why I'm not there, but it was, and then I lost a lot of money out there in Vegas with, uh, with that whole uh, interest, interest uh, situation they had, you know, with all the different homes. A lot of people were losing their homes out there. So that was not great in California. Uh, but I had like a five bed. The house was too big. I should have went smaller. You know, this yeah. is a, uh, you know, and that's, you know, and Titus was my training partner. Uh, through some of these, sure, you know, and he sure, he sure wasn't going to keep you on the straight and narrow. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but then no. I swear, there's a lot of pros that was trying to go that <laughs> route, and I was like, no, you're not going to go that route around me. They were trying to ask me, hey man, you know, they wanted to hang out, they wanted to do this or that, and I was like, no man, I'm not going to be the one to show you nothing, not me. So you got to go yeah. somewhere else if that's what you're trying to do, because. That's one thing about me. I was never trying to hurt anybody or anyone's situation or dreams or whatever. So I didn't want to be a part of that. So a lot of people uh, got turned away. That's that's the kind of stuff you never hear because people don't really talk about that stuff. But I was, I, I was uh, even people that trained with me or whatever. I was nothing but a positive influence on their their their, their life. That's yeah. cool, man. That's really cool. Bro. Yeah. yeah. Really cool. So, so check this out. There's been a lot of times, <clears throat> a lot of people have said over the course of your career that, you know, that uh, they've seen you come into the hotel uh, early morning, <laughs> early morning. Uh, judges. The day of the, uh, the, day of the show. Yes. The damn judges. So, <laughs> so, so here's the question. How many shows the judges you literally out? <laughs> you stay up all night and then literally just not not go to sleep and go go to the show. How many how many shows did you do that way? Um, couple. There was a couple. There was a couple. One was uh, uh, the Olympia. I ended up taking third, and one was uh, won the show in uh, San Francisco. <laughs> Well, it's really unusual, but it clearly works for you. <laughs> it's 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 the, only, the only reason it's in San Francisco, because I ate so much in between shows. We were on a tour, and I was like 270-some pounds, and I had to compete the next day. I was like, oh, shit. I was like, I'm not going to sleep. I'm just going to I'm just gonna do whatever I got to do to lose as much weight as possible. Whatever, you know. But but this and, this uh, is this is, and I end up winning the show and then went right back to hanging out as soon as the show was over. But I won the show and I took third in the show. That's the time that I could say those two those two times it was definitely not not what I'd recommend, but that's what happened. Well, brother, you make it you somehow you made it work. And let me, let me just make sure I got this straight. You said one of these was Mr. Olympia. The biggest show on the planet. You didn't go to sleep. You got you got your competitors are all taking two three days of doing nothing but trying to dial in, and you're out partying the night before. You stroll in, you know, five six in the morning to the hotel, clean yourself up, and and go to pre judging. This this yeah. is crazy, and that's literally how it went. That's how it went. Dude, that's how it went. <laughs> That that's you know wow. that's insane. That's insane. I mean, it's it's a, it. I mean, it, it's just crazy the fact that it was actually possible. You know, because you you think of now, especially now with the protocols and all the things that the guys go through to get to that that place they need to be. Hell, man, yeah. your place your place was in a strip club until four in the morning the night before the <laughs> Olympia. <laughs> but but like I said. Uh, People, 
yeah, it's from that 99 to, yeah. So, yeah, man, it was just crazy. And then, like I say, it was, there was so many guys and there were so many girls around and there was so many people around that was like, you know, some people are not here anymore, you know, obviously, but it was like, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a roller coaster, man. It was like, but I remember sometimes some people would be like, Chris, like, what are you doing? Like, I remember Dorian called me into his room one time. He was in Vegas and he was like, he was like, don't, he was like, and that's when I started calming down when he was like, you don't want to be that guy in a rocking chair wondering what if I would have did this differently or what if I would have done that differently. You, you have what it takes to be anything you want to be. And he was telling me, you, uh, you just need to get the, get the right training, the right atmosphere, the right everything. And you can, you can do it all. You know, and that's that's when things start clicking. It was all around the same time. Uh, he he called me into his room, and that was I was still like the night he called me into his room. It was only him in his room. He had a huge room in Vegas. I remember I was like looking at the clock, like shit. I'm supposed to be at the fucking club right now, and I'm in here talking to Dorian about the shit I shouldn't be doing. I'm like, what? God. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Oh my you get, you get, you get I'm like, a pep talk. I'm like, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, we got. I should be because I was gonna. We we're trying to plan on me coming to train with him in in in, in uh, England, and we was like, okay, we're gonna make it happen. And then when I did, when I was like, okay, this is the year. I'm gonna, you know, gonna put all in. I'm gonna go, and even Mr. Manny was asking me hey man he's like you should go and train with dorian and uh he's jermaine does nothing but gave me the best uh advice or talks you know of my career to where he was like you know he really showed that he, he wanted me wanted the best for me and he he cared about what was transpiring you know i remember one time i just stayed out and I was in Texas, and I was, we were walking into the show, and he was like, he said, what are you going to you be a rock and roll star? Or you want to be a bodybuilder? Which is it, Chris? <laughs> like that. And I remember it like struck me like, damn, like he's fucking, he's really looking like that, you know? Um, when I set out, and, and by the way, like even growing up in Palm Springs, no one would have ever thought that I hung out or whatever. They, they just know me as being a, from, my neighborhood days on up to trying to be uh you know one of the best in the world at something they were like they never they never that that those paths never crossed because people did a lot of stuff in the neighborhood I grew up in, but it was never like something that I was ever even thought of, you know, never even phantom like to have a situation like that involved in my career. And uh, something I need to, you know, even worry about because it was just, I was never that person. So, like I said, it was, and that only came about because some people does, like my my core was Flex, Rico, myself. It was us three. And then it was, then it became four because there was Paul Dillette. So when Paul Dillette uh, came into our circle, it was just us four. And then, uh, we ate, slept, trained, ate, cardio, trained, slept, cardio, trained, worked all together. We never was uh, apart. So when that started to slowly go apart, that's when other people started creeping in. And that's when everything started creeping into my life. So I think um, that being said, that's when when I was saying you got to watch your circle because yeah, you know, like you say, even if you're not that type of person, that shit can creep in just because you're friends with this person. And all of a sudden, yeah. oh, this is what they're doing. This, mm -hmm. you know, and the shit I was seeing happening behind all of that shit, I was like, oh shit, really? You know, so it was, it's just that quick. I'm sure the same thing happened with Mike Tyson. You know, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure of it. So sure. check this out. <clears throat> you know, you talked about Dorian giving you a, a pep talk and. I know there's a lot of really, really top guys back in your era 
that in Ronnie Coleman being one of them, saying point blank, if if Chris would have focused and paid attention to more detail, he probably could have been an Olympia also. What what do you feel? Do you feel like if you'd stayed in that if if that group with you, Rico and Flex and Paul Bullet had stayed together? T- talk to us about no. what you think would have happened. Yeah, I think for sure that would have happened. Um, it's you know it's funny because people take steroids, take whatever they can take to get to make to, to make it to this level of excellence and of uh, physical delivery. Like they just did a, an Adonis and they're one of the, the best. And then there's, there's also a form of uh, almost like afraid you're afraid of the success of where all that comes and what all comes with it you know or and you do those i i I just think i'm not saying that i was that i know i know people like flex that we always dealt with little mental little thing little glitches that got into our uh into our program to where it was like we didn't we didn't, that wasn't our, our goal was to actually make it happen. But then when it was right there to happen, you know, are you willing to do those extra little things? You know, and that's the, the people that went as far as made the Olympia, uh, Jay, uh, Dexter, Ronnie, uh, uh, Dorian, Lee Haney. Yeah, <laughs> those guys was able to do. Those guys were able to do that, and I think uh, that's what separates the actual number one from the number two. So yeah. Definitely one of the top two or two, whatever. But I know there was a day where I actually had the top physique in the world. I don't know which actual what day that was. It may not even have been a competition that day, but I know I had the best physique on the planet mm-hmm. for sure. And, and the best part is you were probably in the strip club all night the night before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I believe, but you know, know. Well, listen, though, but, but to, you know, but also think about how many shows I did. I did just like 73, 75 pro shows. That's amazing. That's shows. And, and think about the hormones that are provided for you to do those shows. So think how horny you are most of the time <laughs> doing our show. Like you you can't how are you gonna blame the one when it's, it's like it came along with the job. You know, it was yeah. just like it was and and if you're already, you know, on the on a better side of testosterone as a good as a good athlete, you're on a better side of testosterone normally. So I mean just think, you know, you putting gasoline on a fire and then you're expecting <laughs> whatever and whatever comes out of it. Then you know it's like, oh, that's you, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that's fucking, yeah, that's fucking great, brother. <laughs> yeah. So, when, when, you. If, if you were to obviously, there was the major distractions was you know the women, the drugs, obviously just the people in general. But if you had to say, if you had to say, what was more distracting to your success? Was it the women or was it the substance? Of course, they work hand in hand, but well, if you had like, to well, single yeah, one out. Because you, it's, I think more, more of the different females that I was involved with was definitely way more. Because it was never, it's not, I mean, it's, it wasn't like, oh, man, I could, it just, everything came along with that. I mean, the, the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll is all, is all blurred together. Right? All tied into one. Yeah. yeah, so, uh, but like I said, uh, but I had I had an amazing run because I I mean I I was really close with Robbie Robinson when I was very young, nineteen, twenty, twenty one. I'm training with with Robbie Robinson already, and he was they were all teaching me him and uh, uh, Gary Stridham. All these people was in my mm-hmm. life pretty deep to where I knew how to be a pro. Long before I was a pro, I was getting deep tissue massage done as a teenager. I was 
I was going through rounds and rounds and rounds of posing and training with the best of the best from a young age. So I knew it was going to happen because I knew I knew what I needed to know to get there before I got there. So I just feel like, you know, I pressured the hell out of myself. And, uh, you know, I was like, I'll do a show. And like, okay, if I don't place in the top five, I'm not doing this no more. I need to go do something else. It was like strong pressure for me to do well. <clears throat> and uh, it was, uh, and when, you know, when, when different sponsors came about, for you, you know, you had to, you had Joe Weir saying, hey, if you, each of you qualify, you need to do that show. And they kept asking me to do the Arnold Classic. So they kept asking me to do this show and that show. So I'm doing, like I said, 10 shows a year. I think that was the biggest thing that kept my mind, like I'm so pressured to do all these shows, you know? So I think just competing so much took its toll, you know? Because a lot of people don't do 10 shows. A lot of these guys do three, four shows, and they're going crazy. So yeah. just think about doing five shows over over a 10-year period every every six months. Yeah. With the wow. best of the best. Yeah. Yeah, you, you were always walking horns with the best. You There was no – in those yeah. days, there, there, was no, there was no easy show to go to. You know? No. No. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that's and, and you said you competed over seventy times. I mean, that's that's amazing. That's as a pro, but even as a teenager, I was doing the show every week. At some time, I remember when I was eighteen. I did, I did uh, ten shows in a year as a teenager. So wow. it was it was just something that uh, you know, coming from a wrestling tournament, and then have the next week having a bodybuilding tournament. You know, I've done that stuff you know, when I was 18, like that. So it was, you know, I would just stand super busy at what I love to do and I would to compete. And uh, yeah. even the people that I train today or or help or, or, or mentor, I just let them know what my experiences was and I've experienced a lot of different things on both sides of the coin. And uh, I... I um, but I am happy to have helped people win world championships and uh, national championships and USA yeah. championships and all these things. Yeah, it's a huge part of this, this journey. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, no question. You be, you become one of the top, uh, you know, in terms of coaching and and just the advising yeah. and all, yeah. everything that comes to helping a competitor get to the top. You're, you're at the top yeah, of the top of the game. Sure. Again, sure. again, brother, which is, I mean, that's you. <laughs> when you do something, you're going to get to the top, which is really fucking cool. You know? <laughs> Thank you, man. Appreciate it. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so I got a quick question here in terms of <clears throat> your air. There's all sorts of talk about when you, like your air of competing, and the level of conditioning versus today, you know, you hear, you hear so many people, oh, the guys today just aren't conditioned like they were back in the day. And then you hear people say, oh, it's the drugs. Oh, it's people don't suffer. Oh, it's this. Let's, let's hear the real deals definition of what's going on here. Um, well, I mean, it's easy to look at a generation and be like, Hey, they didn't look like we did. And I'm sure, uh, the generation before myself was like Lee Haney, Leo Brada. Uh, mm -hmm. There was uh, people who are in the middle of that, like Sean Ray. He was like, he was like right there uh, in oh, the show that I was doing. But I actually met Sean in high school, so he was. It was still. Uh, he was sort of like a an equal in age, but he was still progressed a lot faster than we did. He was shorter than we were. So that has something to do with it. But I just think the look <laughs> the look at the look that they were having, we tried to emulate it. And I think, you know, insulin started to come in to play. When that started, people started changing their look. Um, this this group of athletes, I feel like they're in awe of the vacuum. And we wasn't in awe of the vacuum. That's just that's the that's the new generation uh, thing because it 
it was just part of the pre, it was a just part of the program is to understand how to vacuum your stomach and all that stuff. It was just part of it. No one cared. Every time I did a vacuum, no one no one made a post about it or anything like that or a story about it. It was just part of it. <laughs> and then this group of people got really into the striated glutes. A lot of these guys have striated glutes, but they don't have striations in the quads, but they do in the glutes. They don't have separation throughout the... They don't care about looking like an anatomy chart. They're just a bigger version of everything. Swollen, swollen, look like, you know, just like a big, big, you know, big muscles, big this and that. But I think we were just more into the detail at the time. I don't think you can say uh, particularly, it just depends. And also we were, we had the symmetry round in our day. They don't have the symmetry round now. So you don't, yeah. but you got to get ready for yeah, the that's symmetry clear. round. Yeah, some of these guys in first place are ready just from the symmetry alone. Second place, second round was the, the musculator round. Third was the posing, and then there was the, the, the pose down. So we have four different categories. They only have two categories now. Mm -hmm. So it's muscularity and then the posing, uh, the pose down. So mm -hmm. they don't, it, it's just a different game now. It's not a game where you go in there and do uh, five different rounds of just quarter turns like it's not the thing now you get you might do you might be lucky to do a full set of quarter turns worn one time or two times in the show when before we'll do it seven times so i think yeah. i think a lot of these different <laughs> a, uh, aspects changed what we we're actually looking at yeah <clears throat> and now so, go a little yeah, further too. talking about the judging i know the judging clearly it's got to be leading a lot of this because if they were rewarding what they were rewarding in your day, we'd be seeing different physiques. So what do you think about the judging? Well, I mean, it's the same judges, the same judges I had when I was a teenager. It is the same judges I had when I was uh, in the, uh, the national level and the pro level It's the same people. So they know what they're looking at. Um, you know, the athletes himself, they're showing up with this look or that look. It's not like they don't, they know what it, they know what it is. They, they didn't forget, just like I didn't forget, you know, I, and, but I don't lower my standards, what I like to look at. So, yeah, I don't, but I'm not going to beat the guys down. And plus, before you can talk any kind of way, no one cared. No one care about who said whatever, <laughs> how they put it. But now you can't talk like that these days. So yeah. you just gotta, you just gotta like. I just try to be supportive of the people. You know what my my thing is now? If you look like you work hard, I'm a fan of what you're doing. I'm yeah. a fan of that. You working hard, and you look like you work hard. I'm a fan of that. No matter what the shape or the or the size of it, I just want to see people who look like they they fucking put it down in the gym, you know? Yeah. So, and that's what I think you need to try to focus on more as this next generation is the, you know, a lot of people want to see what you're taking, what they take, how much it was. I don't think that's the, 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 the standpoint of what you should be focusing on. I think you should focus on how can I make myself better in the gym? How can I, how can I develop this part of my physique? How can I sharpen my posing? Mm -hmm. How can I, sharpen my and, and get with the people who's done that to the point to where they you know kind of mastered it because it got watered down to some person that's teaching you taught this person that person trying to teach somebody else that yeah. same that same day or that <clears throat> same week uh and then it's just getting watered down information from how many because how many coaches did we have back then how many coaches do we have now yeah, there's these coaches. Yeah. Some are mad scientists, people. <laughs> some people, they, mm -hmm. some people never coached a day in their never competed a day in their life. But they, they some of the coaches that people were are paying to, to coach them. Um, we didn't have that situation, and we tried to help each other a lot of times back then. Like right, like we're on, on tour. I'm with with uh, uh, Kevin LeBron. 
uh, Dexter Jackson, people like that, we can go to each other's room and help us put Coltan on each other's back. But now you won't see that person. No one talks to They won't even be talking to where you can't even get any type of help or any type of information. Because I know people was doing trade secrets, you know, back then, you know, depending on how good you were, is how people would talk to you. They would, You were really good and they were like, oh, you might beat me. Then someone might be not so easy to give you some information or some type of help of what can make you, uh, would allow you to beat them. But nowadays, I think it's just uh, everyone is, uh, it's just a little different, different pack of people now, you know? But I feel yeah. like, I feel like for the most part, if they, I don't know, I, I don't know. I just don't. I, it's it's not like they're not dieting because I didn't I didn't have those type of ripped up boots like that. That wasn't my look, but that was never my goal because I was on tour with people who was never longer was not there anymore. I was on tour with uh, with Munzer, uh, beat Munzer mm -hmm. many times, but uh, you guys always shredded. Always, yeah. yeah. But that was my, yeah. that was just. So Paper when, thin skin all the time. Yeah, and but when people would pass something like that, I'd be like, "Hey, that's that's not what I'm going for. I'm going for a healthy Lee Haney style looking physique. I'm healthy. I can cut. I got striations. I got shape. I just need some little bit more fullness, and then I'm gonna go and compete. But that's the look I was going for. I was never trying to be the most ripped guy in a, you know, at any stage. That was never my goal." Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Kind of, it was really interesting to hear your take about all these different generations and all the different influence, which then you know kind of changes the look as time goes on. That's a great perspective, you know. Another question I've been, I'm really, really uh, want your take on is what is your perspective? What are your thoughts on all of the? There's been a whole lot of death in bodybuilding in a real short period of time. What, what's give give us your take on that? Um. Like say, Other one for for instance, when I was in the hospital for the the spinal infection, mm -hmm. uh, that's what derailed the whole thing. And you know, I I fought back and forth with my, mentally about you know the mind fuck that comes along with not being able to do what you uh what your goal was all your life and not be able to do it anymore and not be able to compete anymore. And then um, the doctor, I remember he was telling me, he said, Chris, you got the largest heart I ever seen in my entire life. And he said, that's not good at your, I was like 295 pounds at the time. Uh, and he was like, I was like, at the time I got this warrior attitude, like, but this is what I do. You know, I don't, I don't. Uh, yeah, Doc. This is what I do, man. This is what, what I do. Yeah. I want to go out on my shield, you know. I want to go out on my shield. Fuck it, you know. Yeah. And then, uh, and then he was, and I was like, "You have a dangerous job too, Doc. You might get a, a life-threatening disease at any given time in this hospital, but you do it." And he was like, "Yeah, that's true." I said, "Yeah." So this is what I do, you know. But as a couple of years, you know, after that time went on, I felt like I was in a bubble of, I was still in that same bubble. Like, I mean, I was smoking weed in the hospital. Like, I was straight, definitely in a bubble that wasn't right. <laughs> like, like I, what, I would do what things. Are, what, what, are they, what are they saying when you're smoking weed in the <laughs> oh hospital? My God. What, what, the, what, what is Crazy. that? Crazy. <laughs> Uh, see, this well, the good is thing shit. is, <laughs> this is see, this is a shit that that this is the real deal shit right here, brother. I love it. Smoking dope in the hospital. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so, so then when he, uh, so then I said, uh, you know, I, I freaked out when I came out of the coma. I was in the coma for like a month and a half. I came out. And I was like, dude, I, I need to get out of this hospital. Like, I need to get out. Uh, so I, I actually checked myself out through the infection and went to a hotel for about a week. 
And uh, that's when I was like, man, I just want to play my PlayStation and I just want to chill and just, you know, just like get out of it. Because I have claustrophobia because just from wrestling, from the from the stand in the saunas with all these guys trying to lose cut weight and all this stuff, I developed a strong case of, of uh, uh, you know, I can't be any small space like that. I'm, not, I'm yeah. just like so crazy. And uh, so I so I was getting claustrophobic in the hospital. I feel like the walls were coming down and the, the ceiling was getting low on me. I said I had to get out of there. So then I came back. When I came back, then there was then they had a security guard watching me all the time. And they, I had to share a room with this guy who was a little prejudiced old guy that was <laughs> popping the N-word every five minutes. Oh, and, my. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God! And shit on the show. Oh my God! Oh my God! I was like, man, <laughs> yeah. I'm just oh, like, Jesus. I'm like, yeah, I'm just like whipping my curtains back, uh, talking to me. I'm like, give me the fuck alone, dude. I'm trying yeah. to do my time to get out of here, right? <laughs> Jesus. So I was so so at that, People, at that time. But, but back to what I was saying, uh, to have a person tell me and my heart was actually large and I stand a chance of maybe having a heart attack and still not, you know, understanding the, the, the warning signs of that, then, you know, I think a lot of that goes on uh, to this day. So fast forward into we've been through this pandemic the last couple of years. Uh, who knows exactly what's happening with with that, you know? So is it the pandemic? Is it some of the stresses from the pandemic is it the is it the you know people with heart issues? I've, I've seen a lot of athletes in a whole uh, passing coming. away. You know, not just bodybuilders, but I think it's been really sensitive because we have a small group of uh, people in this community to where uh, now uh, you know you, you got to question you know, what exactly what it is. Is it something we signed up for? years ago and the, the 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 chickens is coming home to roost or is it got to do with the pandemic who knows but uh, uh i know a lot of us signed up for that to where you might shave some years off your life that's just uh part of what you know what uh, people signed up for i think the real life situation, but when, but you know, when you're a lot heavier than what you actually should be carrying for your age and your whatever, I mean, you gotta, you gotta be having a close relationship with a doctor, making sure you're okay, making sure you're, yeah. uh, everything's working right, you got the right uh, blood flow, circ uh, circulation, and stuff like that. Yeah. So I just, I just, I don't know exactly what I don't know who's. Getting vaccinated, not getting vaccinated, doesn't make a difference. Is it a? Is it a, a? Are you rolling a dice with that or not? I don't know, but it's been an awful lot. It's been really. Uh, and then even like when they had this fake death with uh, with uh, Victor Richards, that was kind of fucked up. Yeah, that because, was weird. Yeah, because yeah, someone that did that weird. to me. Someone did that to me years ago when I was living in Vegas. But I was I was just so happy I went to Vegas. I was living in Ve I was living in Vegas, but I was also staying and training in LA. So I went to LA. I went to Vegas one night around twelve midnight. I started driving, and I got there around four. Instead of going to my place in Southern Highlands, I kept going into the city, and then I, I went straight to uh, uh, what is this place called? Uh, Dre's. So I ended up going oh, straight, to, straight to Dre's, <laughs> and then from Dre's, I went to a I went to a hotel, a hotel party, hotel room party, and that's why I ended up, you know, going to sleep. It's like I woke up, I woke up the next morning with like 200, 250 phone calls in my phone, two hundred fifty missed calls, and someone said I had passed away. That they they said I went to Vegas and. I never showed up and something must have happened to me. They just considered me dead. So they called my parent, my, my family. Everyone thought I was actually oh dead. Oh my gosh. When I was just like, Holy it shit. was just a miss. Huh? Holy shit. 
Yeah, yeah that's that, that, happened, that happened to me once or twice in the sport where people said, yeah, Chris is dead and this and that. And I was, yeah, the second time was when I was in the coma. I think people were selling my cars and doing all kind of crazy shit back then when they thought oh, I was man. not going to make it through the through the coma, you know? <laughs> that, go, that goes right back wow. to you saying that you got you, the wrong people around you, man. They're, they're fire yeah. selling your shit. The motherfucker, they take <laughs> your, your chick out. <laughs> <laughs> fucking awards missing all kind of shit's missing Jesus Christ yeah it was fucked up crazy. so brother as we kind of turned you know you, you you spoke of earlier in your I think it was early in your uh, your movie you talked about you actually at one point you were homesick because you missed your mom she got a great relationship with your mom and myself, I'm a fucking straight up mama's boy, so I understand that completely. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm still to this day a mama's boy. You know, <clears throat> you know, and obviously, anytime our moms find out that we've been up to no good, it fucking breaks our hearts. Oh, what, yeah. what was it like for you when when your mom when your mom finally basically kind of when she when she kind of let you know that hey, I know what's been going on. Oh, it was just you know, it was what, shocking. What was like? you, it was shocking because you think you're getting over. You think you're like smarter than the, than than the average bear type of person and and they, they don't know that at their age they don't they don't know but they, they know <laughs> yeah. they, they yeah. know darn well she, she had you she had you she knows yeah. everything about you she yes. knows every, so, movement, every facial you expression she knows everything about you. you cannot fool your parents for sure that is yeah. a no you just can't do it people think yeah. you can and uh they think you, you think growing up, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. But even my dad was like, my dad was like, man, I had to pretend I was all pissed off at you when I would see it. I was like, I would have been doing the same shit too. He said, <laughs> you gotta go in there and pretend I was oh, pissed off at you. Because my mother yeah, would be mad at you. <laughs> your mom comes home and says, Can you? I went in Chris's house and there was naked <laughs> people cleaning up our stuff. You know, because they were, cause dad, they were cleaning up. They were, yeah. <laughs> And your dad inside is going, yes, boy, go get it. Yeah, yeah, that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually kind of know what that's like. Because uh, yeah. my boy with his, with his girlfriend. Right. Had to, had to give him a little bit of a lecture. That's it. But then kind of like the fist bump on the way down. You're like, you like my wife's sitting there losing her mind. Yeah, boy, She's you just can't screaming and yelling. That stuff. <laughs> I wouldn't be doing that if I were you. Oh shit! That's that's too fucking funny, brother. That, that, is, that, is, that is fucking yeah. good. Yeah. Oh man. Well, brother, I gotta tell you, we, we really appreciate you coming on. But before we go, there's one thing that I I want to ask you in terms of you know you. I mean, you've been you what you've done is amazing. Not to mention how you've done it with you know, with the distractions you've had and you've had such a, a positive influence on the sport in general. And now as a coach, even more so, you know, like I said, anything you choose to do, you do it and you do it all the way and you become great at it, which is amazing. So what is, what is Chris Cormier's legacy? What, what is it that when it's all over, you know, when, when you're gone, what is it that you want to be remembered for? Well, I mean, I started out, People doubted me the whole time. Was I able to do it? Was I able to be that person uh, that I wanted to be in the sport? Was I able to accomplish, you know, winning as many shows as I won and uh, persevering through all the stuff, uh, the good and the bad? I mean, even taking second in the Arnold Classic six years in a row, six years in a row, wasn't easy to deal with mentally, you know, but I found myself you know, coming back time after time, trying to win that, that, uh, that show. Um, I think, you know, being able to go full <clears throat> circle, um, full circle as far as maybe promoting the Chris Comer classic, which is uh, May 21st of this year in Milwaukee. Um, nice. my fourth one, fourth one. So that's a whole nother enjoyment for me to give back to the sport that gave me everything. Um, 
And that's why it's hard for me to hear people talking bad about the sport because no one made anyone do what they did to get to this point. No one made you. Yes. You wanted to yeah. do this. Don't talk shit yeah. and still trying to make money off it while you're talking shit about it. You're still yeah. trying to still trying to get clients, but you're still talking shit because you didn't yeah. get what you wanted out of it. You know, and that's one thing uh, I pride myself on not trying to blame anybody for anything that I did or chose to do. Um, I had the opportunity to do, uh, to compete all around the world, uh, meet so many people, so many good people, and uh, just, you know, like I said, promoting. Also, um, I want to promote more. I want to get some shows in other countries. I want to do even more so, so I'm, I'm not there yet. Also want to teach what I've learned in the last 30 some years, almost 40 years now uh, in the gym, you know, through some affordable ways to do so, but it's going to be a give and take, but affordable ways to do so. And just to be like, yeah. this is the way you get the blueprint to make all this stuff happen. You just have to follow the blueprint and you will be, you will succeed on your own, uh, in your, your own lane, your own lane and your physique. I can't make everyone look like Ronnie Coleman or make everyone look like Jay Cover, but for yourself, I know I can change your, 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 uh, your look or improve it to, to the best of your ability or the, that individual's ability. And also, um, yeah, so once all that's done, then I can feel like, yeah, I'm at the end of the, end of the, uh, uh, end of the race that I started uh, many years ago. But I'm not done till I do all those things. But I want to, I still want to continue on with the Chris Comer Classic, uh, hopefully in China, hopefully in Brazil, and uh, hopefully uh, another part of uh, of America. But that's that's my goal right now. That's that's what I want to leave behind that that legacy. That's really cool, brother. <clears throat> well, you know, like I said, man, you you've affected a lot of people here, and uh, you know you're still doing it and, and now you're doing it in a way where you can take people that are coming in and you can give them your knowledge and your knowledge is priceless brother. So <clears throat> I got to say, you, you, this was so much having so much, so much fun having you on. We're going to definitely have to do another episode with you. If you're cool with it, because <laughs> yeah. hell, all we did was bullshit yeah. to talk about the crazy stuff. Hell, we, didn't even, <laughs> we didn't even talk much about competing and a whole lot of other stuff. So yeah, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll definitely do it again in the, in the future. Sure, Nick, yeah. you got any- no man, any, anytime brother, anytime. Yeah. Nick, you got anything else for Chris before we go? No, it was just an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure doing this with you and i'm just glad i don't have to tackle you i'm, I'm good with that <laughs> once was plenty so it, thank you so much for everything and it's, it's thanks, amazing guys. what the kids are going to be able to learn from you so thank you oh uh, for sure thank you man thanks for having me man good to see you brother always good to see you yeah, nick see you. man like uh thanks. you always greet me with a smile and a, and a big old hug every time i see you so i appreciate yeah. that man not forgetting about the little bro. And, uh, yeah, man. <laughs> that's it. Uh-huh. That's it. Well, that's good to see that's you. Gonna do it. That's going to do it for another edition of Legends of Iron. We will see you next time. Legends of Iron is brought to you by Muscle Mets. Muscle Mets is the creator of Carnivore. Beef built muscle, and Carnivore is the world's number one selling beef protein.